My name is Tad Brinkerhoff. I'm the former managing director with the Global Management Center now with the MBA uh, office at the Marriott School. We're very happy to have uh, three very distinguished and experienced panelists to talk about international careers. The thing we find at BYU with the international exposure, a lot of students are very interested in international careers, but sometimes they don't know what exactly that means. They want to do something international, but they're not sure how to formulate an international career. And sometimes they don't have all the information they need to make good decisions about uh, what it means to pursue international career. And that was the whole purpose of this forum today as part of International Education Week. And I'm not going to take very much time as the moderator. I, I do want to just briefly introduce our three panelists. Uh, the, the person on the far left is Jason Golly from New Ways International. Uh, in the middle is Marcy Holloman from Zilog. Uh, it's a semiconductor company in California. And then closest to me is Lori Larry Hoer from, um, li currently living in Alpine, but um, has lived, all of these people have lived all over the world in different capacities. We're going to turn the time over to them to, to maybe take about uh, five to ten minutes each and give a little b background on what their international experience has been in, a, in different roles. Uh, and then maybe give some, uh, some advice or, or some information that might be interested, interesting to you. And then when they're done with that, we're going to turn the time over to you students to ask questions uh, that you have interest in. And I also have a list of questions that I can ask as well that we'd like them to address. So. Uh, we need to finish at about 5 to 1, if that's okay, but um, we'll go ahead and start with, actually let's start with Jason. Uh, if you want to give your, you can just grab a mic and give a good Well, you know what, there, there are a lot of empty seats up front and I wouldn't need to use a microphone if <laughs> people wanted to move forward a little bit. I'm convinced that's the smart end of the table, the, the, and, and that's no offense to you. I'm convinced as well that international business isn't nearly as complex as many of us would like to think it is and as perhaps many of us are told it is and I'm a testament to that I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed and why do I say that not not to belittle myself but to say that anyone who has any interest in conducting or being involved with international business certainly can reach for and achieve that if that is a goal and in reaching for that early on, in fact, as a perpetual undergraduate, I was given an opportunity to take on something that I think from many perspectives you would consider me at the time as not being qualified to do. But I threw my head in the ring anyway and, and was incredibly aggressive and, and somehow was able to get the job. But from that point going forward, and I'll speak to those experiences in just a minute, but from that point going forward, it's been an incredible learning experience, and I'm hoping today, rather than take your time by delivering information about myself that's probably not all that interesting, is to maybe share with you some of the ideas, tricks, if I can call them that, some of the pointers that I've picked up along the way that really add value to a person. In in the last 10 years, I've had, it's, it's an opportunity, but also it's a saddening opportunity for me to interview a great number of people for a whole spectrum of jobs relating to international business in our company. And I have to say that when we put the word out to hire for any particular position, I get a stack this thick of MBAs. It's no joke. I'm just a huge stack. Everybody has an MBA. And the first question I ask is, what makes this guy different from this lady, from this guy, from this lady? Because they all have the same degree from the same, same institution. They're really intelligent people, obviously. But what, what as an employer do I look at in each of these people that's going to differentiate one between the other and perhaps elevate one above the rest? And that's something I'd like to speak on a little bit today. But as an international, well, as an expatriate managing director in a number of different countries, we've, I have learned a number of things that I'm hoping you will find valuable if, if you ask the right questions. But doing international business is incredibly interesting. It can be incredibly rewarding and something that will change your lives for better or for worse. I do a presentation on being an expatriate employee. And the first question I ask is, is it a golden, is it a pair of golden handcuffs? Or is it a noose? Because it can be either. 
And it's something that we all, if, if any of you have interests in becoming an expatriate manager or employee of, of, of a large firm, you need to ask before you get into it. You need to understand what being an expat is all about. And these two uh, very distinguished people here can tell you and speak to that much better than I. Would you, would you define expat? Oh, I'm sorry. Does anybody, has anyone ever here been an expat or, okay. An expatriate as a verb means to leave your home country and, and go someplace else. But expatriate managers are those who are residents of one country, let's say an American, and they are employed to work elsewhere outside of their, their home country. And it looks like I think everybody here has done that. And it's kind of the holy grail. I know when, when you're in school you think, man, I am so going back to wherever it was you had your experience, presumably on a mission or, or you read about it or you had a childhood fantasy of working in somewhere. And you think how cool it would be to go back and, and actually make money being at a place where you've always wanted to be. And it can absolutely be done. It really can be done. But you've got to do it right. And, and I think these people here will help you understand how to do it right and, and how to go into it with your eyes open as opposed to just thinking that it's, it's something that everybody can do easily. Okay, thanks Jason. Marcy? Okay. So I'm actually, I'm not too far off from where uh, all of you are right now. I, I look out and I, I remember so vividly all the classes I've had in this room and uh, just great experiences I've had here in the Kennedy Center and all around campus. Um, just to give a brief um, summary of kind of my journey, I have, I graduated as a Kennedy Center alumni in 2002, in 2001, and then went to uh, the Marriott School to do an MOB, which then became an MBA. And um, I grew up um, since I was eight years old in Asia. So kind of what um, Jason was talking about. I, I grew up loving the Asian culture. I grew up um, you know, being an expat child. So I kind of I <coughs> loved that life and I was often kind of conflicted as to, well, should I, should I go back and live that or should I do something completely different? And I think finding this major helped me to explore those different options. And um, I dabbled in a lot of things. The Kennedy Center offers a lot of different tracks, different paths, and I really debated, you know, do I want to go into business? Do I want to go into development? Do I want to go into um, diplomacy or government? And I actually tried all three, because I didn't want to feel limited. And I did about four different internships, and you know, made use of each of those summers that I had in between, um, in between college years, and that just you know enabled me to just kind of get the flavor of of each uh, industry, of each sector, and you know, at times I just felt like I was you know had ADHD that I couldn't figure out what I wanted, but then when I when I decided to go to graduate school, everything kind of fit together and studying organizational behavior helped me to see that all of these experiences I had had were with different kinds of organizations and that I could really apply the skills I was learning to any sector, any type of company or organization, whether it's the church, whether it's a family, whether it's you know, a business. And so um, this opportunity I have now, um, I'm not an expatriate now, I work um, in Silicon Valley in California. It's a very dynamic, very just exciting place to be. The business changes, you know, from morning to afternoon to evening. We can be going completely different directions. Um, but I am a business partner for our, our um, business in Asia. So I get to kind of have the best of both worlds and I see that I probably won't be in this forever. I'll probably go back to maybe some some nonprofit work or some government work in the future, but I think this foundation I got here at the Kennedy Center, doing the internships, doing MUN, doing Students for International Development, getting involved is what just opened my eyes to all the opportunities that there are. So, okay. 
Well, first of all, I just want you to know that, um, you know, it was really an honor for Richard to contact me and ask um, me to speak. It was an honor for me because I love talking about living overseas. It's, it's very near and dear to my heart, and it has had a profound impact on my life, and it's one of my favorite experiences that I've had. Out of 24 years of marriage, I've spent um, probably about 18 years living in Asia. In fact, Marcy was in my ward um, years ago when she was young, and I was younger <laughs> um, than I am now. Um, and 13 of those years were spent living in Hong Kong, so that's really where a lot of my experience has been. Um, three years ago, we moved our family to Fruit Heights, Utah, so we're now here, but my husband is still working in, in um, China and in Hong Kong, and he's splitting his time between Utah and Asia right now. Um, today, I just wanted to share some thoughts that I have about the blessings and challenges of being an expat wife. Um, I, um, excuse me, my husband is the one who was working um, mostly through all those years, and so I was the wife, and it's a very unique experience, and I thought that maybe I would just address that if some of you might um, have that opportunity, or those of you men who are planning on working overseas, you, there's some things you might want to know about um, for your wife, because it, it's, um, it's an interesting adjustment. Um, I have to say that my husband, Mike, is a very clever man. Before I met him and married him, I had never even been out of the country. Um, and I promised my mother, who's here today, that um, I would live right next door to her and never move away. And, you know, I broke that promise about 18 months after I was married, and Mike and I finished our degrees at BYU. And we moved to China. We headed to China. This was back in 1982. And he was asked to set up a business school, and I was to teach English at three different universities. And so um, off we went to China. And I say that he's clever because what he did is really set the bar low. <laughs> Our Chinese apartment had no heat, no hot water, no refrigeration. And I spent two hours every night scrubbing clothes on a scrub board. And um, I remember teaching classes in the winter. And one time I was at the chalkboard, and my hand literally froze at the chalkboard because there was no heat in the room. And I turned around and looked at my students. Their breath is coming out in puffs. And you know, it just they used coal back then to heat um, for heating and to um, you know, keep warm. And it was rationed. And so we only had hot showers once a week. And so whenever we'd hear the, the pipes clanging, we'd stop whatever we were doing and rush to the bathroom so we could all get a hot shower. So, you know, we talk about raising the bar. Well, the bar could not get, you know, any lower than that. So it could only go up from there. Um, and so I've been blessed throughout these years to live the overseas, you know, expat lifestyle from both ends of the spectrum, um, from very meager living conditions in China all the way um, to Japan and Singapore and Hong Kong where we had the full expat package which I hope some of you will ask about that later on because I'd love to tell you more about that, um, you know, including cars and maids and clubs and private schooling for the kids and housing allowance and home leave, et cetera. And so um, I've really met hundreds of expat families who they all share the challenges and blessings of, of living overseas. Now, some families thrive in that environment and some families really struggle. And so the secret that I, the secret I believe to successfully having family life overseas is how well the wife, um, who is the heart of the home, um, embraces the experience and adjusts to the challenges and the differences that she encounters. She is the key. And for any businessman who has lived overseas, um, you know, if you ask them what really makes him successful, he will tell you that it's how well his wife adjusts to that experience. And I've known very successful businessmen who are totally into the new country and the new experience and they just loved it while their wives just were having a hard time accepting the fact there was no Walmart or Kmart there, you know, it, and it really makes a difference. And so, you know, in Hong Kong, for example, shopping is an everyday thing. The stores are tiny and um, you pretty much go every day and they have fresh fruit stands and vegetable stalls and open air markets down the street where every imaginable creature is, you know, for sale for your dinner table from snakes to lobster. Um, and it's an experience to embrace. You know, everyone's speaking Cantonese. It's very, it smells interesting. And, you know, it's always crowded. And so if, if a person expects life overseas to be the same as it is in the U.S., they're going to fail to reap the blessings that come from um, living with the difference. And so this is what I mean when I say that the challenges that you experience overseas can become your blessings. 
And I'd like to talk about some of the challenges. I picked three to focus on. But I hope that you'll ask questions later um, for each of us because um, there's lots that we could talk about. The first challenge that I thought I would address is um, challenge, or is, excuse me, traveling husbands. Um, and so if you're an expat wife, your spouse often will travel. If you're, if you're the wife who's working, and um, quite honestly, that only happened with a few families that, um, that I encountered in Asia. It was mainly the men that worked. Um, I'm sure that's changing now, and I'm sure it will change in your generation. You know, more and more women are working. But um, for us, for the wives whose husbands travel a great deal, it's a challenge. And um, it also can bring a few blessings. But for me, the challenges include the fact that for a few days every week, or in my case right now where my husband is splitting his time, it's a few weeks every month or a couple weeks every month. Um, I'm a single mom. And that means that I run the show. Now, this can be great, but it also can be really stressful. And um, I'm the one who calls family prayers. I'm the one who leads scripture study in the morning. I do family nights. I'm the one who shuffles the kids here and there. And, um, you know, not doing those things just because my husband isn't around is not an option for me because they're important. And so I have to do them. And um, family decisions are many, many times made by me because I don't have time sometimes to track down my husband in whatever country he's in or time zone to check on and see what he thinks and get his input. I like to do that, and often it's after the fact, and sometimes I don't do it right, but you know we work on that. And so it, it's a heavy weight sometimes, and, and you need to know about that going in. Those of you who aren't married yet, um, that will fall on your wife, or those of you uh, women who are working that can fall on your spouse. Um, in fact, my husband travels so often and is usually in um, various cities in China that sometimes we don't know where he is at all. <laughs> um, I have his itinerary, but sometimes I'm just not clear where he is. And I remember one time for a whole week, my kids and I, we were saying our family prayers every night and praying for daddy that he'll be safe in China. And it wasn't until he came home later that week that we realized he was in India the whole week. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, one of the, well, I will say this, he's awesome when he's in town. He, he's totally into our family life, and he's always coached the kids' soccer teams and done everything with the kids' scouting and everything. And so when he's there, he's, he's great. Um, but when he's gone, these things fall on me. And so that includes the discipline of the kids and includes following through with the family rules. And so the biggest challenge, I think, is that when he comes back, there's a shift in power, and both of us now have to you know, make the decisions and include each other in, in the decisions. And sometimes I feel like he messes up my system. <laughs> and sometimes he feels like I've messed up the system he thought was in place before he left. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge and we work on that. And, and that's, um, that's just something we work on. Now keeping family relationships strong when one of the spouse, uh, the spouse is constantly going is also a challenge. Um, when Mike is gone, we make sure that we're in constant communication. Every day, at least, we talk on the phone. Sometimes it can be up to an hour or two hours at a time, depending on, you know, if he's in a remote location where phone service is not um, convenient, then we don't. But thank goodness we have um, the email and Internet. Um, I can tell him what's going on with the kids, and he often will write emails to the kids because they're always on the computer, and that's how they're used to communicating. So that works pretty well for us. But what we do is we both make sure that we're making each other a high priority when it comes to communication. And um, when we can't physically be together, we, we make sure that we are somehow emotionally connected. Um, in fact, this past week, this was so exciting for me, I got a FedEx package and I just assumed that it had work papers for my husband. And so when I opened it, I was really thrilled and touched to find out that this is a love letter to me from Mike. And he was in London this week. And he just wrote me a love letter and just wanted me to know how much I mean to him. And one of the things he specifically thanked me for was carrying on the extra load when he's gone. And so I appreciate that. In fact, one of my kids this week, um, they were supposed to talk about in school what they're, what they're proud about with their mom. And I thought, oh, my child's going to say, oh, it's because I work out every day or, oh, because I, you know, do something. He said, I'm proud of you because you, you are a single mom a lot of times and you carry our family. And that meant a lot to me. It really did. And so... I don't know how many people can boast of getting a FedEx love letter this week, but I got one. <laughs> um, the second issue that I thought I would address um, is friendships. 
Now, one of the challenges of living overseas is that you're very, you're separated from your extended family by great distances often. And so we can't usually share the holidays with our families or, um, and I'm gonna cry if I look at you guys. So <laughs> we can't, you know, be, celebrate birthdays with our grandparents and those that we love sometimes. So one of the blessings that many expat families do enjoy is that if you have an expat package, if you, you know, got the full deal, you'll have a home leave. And I'm sure Marcy remembers this. You, you have like three months in the summer where you can go back to your homeland and be with your extended family, spend some quality time with your grandparents, and that's a great blessing. But because expats don't have family close by and because we're all in a foreign land sharing a common experience, friendships between expatriate families um, tend to be extremely close and very, very meaningful. The people that I have known over the years in different um, countries are among my most cherished relationships in my life. Um, friends become like your family when you live overseas, and that's a blessing that I really treasure. Now, our children attended an international school, and, and right here I'll say that's another blessing of living overseas because the quality of education with these private schools is sometimes just incredible, you know, really, really, just a real blessing. Um, and so because of that international environment in their schools and in the community, my children had friends from all over the world. At our home when the kids were little, they might have, you know, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, French, Indian, you know, Norwegian kids playing with them all at the same time. It was like a little UN. And I just loved that. That is, it was just really, really one of the things that I love. But one of the challenges I will say is that all of us, when we live overseas, we tend to lose friends often because expatriate families tend to um, move a lot and, and relocate to other um, areas. And so it's tough on kids to lose their best friends. It's tough on adults to lose your closest, cherished friends um, when they go overseas. But the other thing I will say is that living overseas makes the world very small. And so you often run into these people you know, in various things, or it, you know, who asked me today? You asked, you know, who was it? You asked me, you know, do you know Brent and Brenda Christensen? And of course, I know them. They, since they moved from Hong Kong, they went down to Africa and lived, and now they're in Beijing. And this is his sister-in-law and their family. So, it's just it makes it really small, which is really nice. And the last topic that I wanted to address are the blessings and challenges of being a member of the church in another country. One of the challenges that we found overseas has been that there just aren't as many LDS kids um, there um, for your children to associate with. When our children were little, this really wasn't a big issue, but as they became teenagers, it became a big issue. And um, some LDS kids will find that they thrive in an environment where they're the only um, you know, Mormon at their school, but other kids find this to be an overwhelming challenge. So I just wanted to say that, um, but having said that, uh, Many kids find that they are closer to their parents and also to their siblings because they're in that environment, because their home life is really the only constant that they have. And I can tell you in my family, sorry, that my kids are extremely close to each other. They love to hang out with each other and um, they consider each other to be their best friends. And so that's a tremendous blessing despite the challenges that we've had because of it. Serving in the church overseas can also be another blessing because wards and branches are really small. And so you have lots of opportunities to serve. It's not uncommon to have several callings at a time. And I remember when Mike was the bishop and he was a scoutmaster at the same time that I was the activities chairman and the early morning seminary teacher. And so this can be um, a challenge, but it's also a blessing because we've always found that when we served and those opportunities um, came to us, we were blessed. And another blessing with regards to the church is that mission oppor missionary opportunities abound um, in many countries. And this has greatly added to when we lived overseas to our sense of purpose as an LDS expat family. I treasure the experiences that our families have had, um, our family has had, and which Mike continues to have as he lives in a land um, largely in China where he is um, surrounded by so many people who are not members of the church. And in closing, I just feel that experiencing life overseas has added such a dimension um, and a richness and fullness to my life that I am eternally grateful for it. Um, <coughs> each of us in our family feel that we benefited by becoming more independent, more open-minded, more well-traveled, um, and exposed to the, beauty, the beauties of various lands and different people. Living overseas is a privilege, and it's a privilege to represent our country and to represent our church in another land. And this is what expat families do every day. And um, 
the challenges are certainly there, but the blessings are certainly there as well. And the secret is to focus on the blessings and learn from the challenges. That was excellent. Um, as you can tell, we've got a diverse panel, and that was done intentionally. We wanted you to see the different facets of what it's like to work in an international career, not necessarily meaning you work overseas. But that could be a dimension of it. Or you might not be the employee. You might be the spouse. Um, and then uh, you can see there's different stages of career development as well uh, from each of the three panelists. We're going to open it up to questions, and uh, if you just raise your hand and direct your question either to one of the panelists in specific or uh, all three of them, if you could you could do that. Uh, and if you don't have questions, I have some. So we're just going to open it up right now. Does anyone have any specific questions they would like to ask? Right here in the back. three to answer sure go ahead. Oh, I'll start and then you guys add whatever I was thinking about that today that um, you know you your age group and everything I'm considerably older in fact my kids are your age now so when you're just starting out um, it's tough to ask for a full expat package they it costs a lot for companies to send you overseas what I would really focus on is getting the opportunity of working there no matter what, even if you don't have an expat package. I would certainly just, I would just say in an inter interview, you know, um, you haven't mentioned any benefits, you know, I don't know if there are any, and let them take it from there. And if there aren't, I would just say, you know, that's fine because you're young and they really probably will not pay a lot of money to have you go over there at this stage of the game, but definitely go. Um, do whatever you can, can whatever you can to get there because it will look great on your resume. It will be the experience of a lifetime. When Mike and I went to China, we made three hundred dollars. This was out of MBA school. We made three hundred dollars combined um, for our jobs, and BYU didn't even report that in their statistics, you know, because it was too embarrassing. <laughs> they were happy to say they had somebody in China, but they didn't want to report our salary, and it didn't matter because that that was the springboard for us of a lifetime of plenty of packages and money and everything that follows. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, if you're married and you have children, you guys should do this when you're young because if you're married with children, it is very difficult to go in on local packages in some of these countries because it's so expensive. When, when you're at your stage, you know, if you're in Hong Kong, it's fine to spend $500 a month maybe on a little um, you know, apartment and you don't need to get a car, you don't need a club certainly, and you don't need schooling for your kids. But once you get more, farther along in life, um, those packages become important and it's, it's tough when you don't have them. It doesn't mean you can't do it and um, I would say just to get the opportunity to start out, I would go with even without a package. An expatriate employee costs the employer about 300 percent of the salary so what you have to do is prove that you're 300 percent more valuable than the next guy which is nearly impossible if you're fresh out of school but offering yourself as a potential local hire if there's an entity on the ground as you mentioned is far and away the best approach because it sends a message first and foremost to the employer that you're willing to forego some things that you really don't need at this stage in your and that you want to learn, that you're ambitious, and all the things that I'm sure your career counselors have been telling you that this is the image you have to present, but in differentiating yourself from everybody else, you need to show value. And, and value is something an employer is going to put on you if they see that you are going to wake up earlier, stay up later, take less compensation, and produce more results than everybody else. Who 
but at the same time, if you're in that negotiation phase and you're, I think if there's opportunities to be creative about what specific things, you know, if, if you have identified maybe you know, a stipend for, for a living or, um, you know, education, you know, schools that might cost a little bit more for children, you know, maybe picking one or two things that you feel like you can lay on the negotiation table because it can't hurt to ask. In fact, you know, myself being in a HR, I, I think someone that can come to the table with a very, you know, have well researched what, what their needs are or um, how much it might cost for their family to live, their value in my eyes would raise up a lot higher because they've done that research. Perhaps just mentioning briefly, and you can speak to this probably better than I, what is an expat package mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what's in there? Yeah. If, you, if you just take a round number, say $100,000 as your base salary, you have to figure that education is going to cost roughly $10,000 per child each year. It'll cost the company about 30, well, between twenty dollars and $30,000 to pack up all your stuff and get it to where you're going. And, and warehouse what you don't take. <coughs> Excuse me. It'll cost them about fifteen thousand, well between ten and twenty thousand for your summer leave to bring you back home with your family and then bring you back. Your tax equalization package, which pays the delta between what you would pay here and what you're going to pay in your new jurisdiction, will cost the employer, including the service fee of the accounting firm doing it anywhere from uh, ten to fifty thousand dollars <throat> and so you can see instantly you're adding all these incremental costs if you want your children to be educated if you want to come home in the summer of course the housing allowance which is a huge huge yes. one will cost the employer anywhere from thirty to, to eighty thousand dollars a year and then your your That's automobile good. bonus yeah. will, will yeah. probably be well. somewhere to the tune of mm -hmm. fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a year so all of these things that become later on in, in your life a life necessity, which earlier on you can forego, is something you need to be creative with. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. We've just been asked to make sure we speak into the microphone. They're recording oh, the session. Oh. So what we need to do is, after question is asked, if you can repeat the question so it can be picked up on the recording, okay. that would be great. There was another question in the back, or did you have the same question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to ask one. Trends. What are what trends do you see in international careers, be it multinationals staying in the states like Marcy's doing, or relocating your family overseas? Now we've talked about how expensive it is, but maybe each one of you could address trends. Laura, you've you've had an extensive time period. Maybe you can address any trends that would help students that are planning a career 20, 30 years down the road? Um, what comes to mind are some of the things that have to do with packages because, um, it, for example, in Hong Kong, what I've noticed when we first got there, there, the international school was made up of maybe, I would say, 70 to 80 percent American kids. By the time we left 13 years later, it was that many local Chinese kids and very few relatively American kids were in the school anymore. And what that just showed was a trend where expat families were leaving Hong Kong because it was so expensive. Um, I had friends whose rent was 18,000 US dollars a month for an apartment. Um, my rent, we were paying um, around, I think it was like eleven or $10,000 a month. You can see, like, like he was saying, how expensive that is for companies. And so what they were doing, they were taking away the, the housing allowance and having people be on local packages, and people were just leaving. So I, one of the trends that I'm seeing are um, families that maybe take their families, like actually like what I'm doing right now, where my family is in Hong Kong and my husband is working in Asia and he's in a little tiny apartment that he pays for by himself. It's five feet by, no, it's seven feet by 12 feet long. You can touch every wall in his apartment from the bed. And so I have several friends who are doing that now, and I, I would say that that's a trend um, where, you know, you, and it's not something I recommend, by the way, splitting up families like that. 
but um, it is something that I'm, I'm seeing more and more. So um, it's becoming very expensive for some of these companies that have families over there. I, um, I see two major trends right now. One is this shift towards, um, well, just the level of education of um, people in, in many um, countries around the world, especially India and China, is making outsourcing the answer for most companies. So I know in the high tech industry, it just doesn't make sense to hire expatriates, except for very high level, um, you know, VP and above positions. So, you know, really the answer is that you have to become a global team. And so there's much more travel back and forth. So, you know, we have people that are spending half their time in, in India, half their time in China, and half the time in the U.S. So learning to live with that. The other trend is um, just, I think those were the two things, just the, the increased level of education of people overseas and then that globalization of things. So it's so much easier to communicate that the travel just makes more sense. The world is absolutely much, much smaller. And if you ask why do employers even expatriate people to begin with, most often it's because the, the company values this person's expertise and they know they're not going to find that expertise locally. Trust is a huge factor, especially with China in the early days. You didn't want to just hire someone in China and, and hope that they'll handle your business and, and handle your affairs and do it all equitably, which, which actually was a misconception or a misperception, I believe, in many cases. But, you know, frankly, that's the perception that was out there. And you have to just live with the realities that people believe, whether it's perceived or otherwise. You have the issue of of um, companies wanting to expatriate employees because they're trying to create different opportunities for employees, which is, I think, less frequent than, than most of the other issues. So when you look at the reasons why a company would even expatriate somebody, you have to say that in most cases, if before you couldn't find people you could trust or you thought, and you didn't find expertise in the markets, you're finding a lot more of both. You really are. And, and so what you have to do is present to the employer that you can work as a local hire. That is absolutely a huge trend. You hear once a bishop, always a bishop. Once an expat, you're always an expat. And as soon as you become an expat, your name floats to the top of all the headhunter lists. Mm -hmm. Because what they want to do is, if I'm looking for an expat in India, what I'm going to do, or if I'm looking for an employer in India, employee, sorry, I'm going to hire an expat who's already there because I don't have to pay to get him there. And I can probably negotiate a different package that's going to cost me much less than expat expatriating somebody else over there. So the trend is cost savings. Absolutely, margins are shrinking in across virtually every industry in the world. And you can thank Walmart for most of that, I'm sure, if you're in retail. So you've got these razor thin margins. You have more demanding shareholders. You have rising costs in a lot of cases, where do you cut costs? Well, few employers will look at the expenditures to keep expatriate employees working as being a critical necessity to business function. They'll say, oh, we can cut, cut back on that, I'm sure. And there they are, we are, mm -hmm. and I don't know anybody else who isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Um, what kind of jobs are available? Um, like, what's the job market like in international, you know, say business or, or also in the public sec uh, sector, government jobs, nonprofit jobs, stuff like which of, which of those um, job markets is, is growing faster and has better opportunities? And I don't know anything about that really. Do you know? Um, Marcy, will you repeat the question? Sure. So the question was, where are the opportunities the greatest right now in international related jobs? Is it public sector, government, or is it private or nonprofit? Um, honestly, you know, I think there will always, the private sector will always be full of international opportunities and that will just increase. You know, we're just becoming more connected globally. That's a trend that's, you know, will be forever increasing. I think the need for more 
highly trained people in uh, with an international background in government is greater than ever before but I think there's been a kind of a trend you know that was kind of a, a much more popular choice maybe 10 15 years ago um, for probably a variety of reasons now I'm seeing that the, the opportunities the packages the um, the opportunity to kind of rise up faster is in government. Um, nonprofit, that's an area that I just, uh, I'm very passionate about. Um, and I see that there's, you know, it's really, the sky's the limit and the kind of creativity you wanna have. You know, do you, what, what area do you feel most passionate about? We'll get into that and then the opportunities will come. If you love the language, if you love the people, if you have you know a skill set that you really want to use then the opportunities will present themselves if you go after them but i think the need there and kind of the untapped opportunities really in government in a lot of ways business will always be there <laughs> speaking of the private sector you're an incredibly benevolent person <laughs> That's neat. I'm honored. in in the private sector if you are focused don't, I mean, don't just get an MBA and say, I want to do international business and hope you land somewhere outside the borders of the United States. That focus you mentioned is incredibly important. And if, and if you're focused now on these emerging markets, you know, China is on everybody's radar screen. Russia is on the radar screens of the ambitious. Uh, Indonesia, and, and I can go down the list, the traditional economies of Western Europe and, and certain Latin American markets, although many Latin American markets are also very interesting to a lot of employers, are, anyway, the traditional markets just really aren't holding the appeal for expatriates because there are so many well-qualified people on the ground already. But when you're looking at these new, emerging, developing markets where the business is just going crazy, no matter what business you're in, and you, you have a hard time containing the growth, if you can focus on any of those markets and show that you can help a company achieve any of its goals of either containing, like a lot of companies are dealing with in China, or expanding, whatever it might be, you need to make sure you point that out and experience either through internships or entrepreneurial activities that you might have engaged in those markets or even just language. One of the things I thought was pretty fun when I worked on, on a, a project with Tad was I presented to some of his students a list, a, a, just a quick little matrix of business vocabulary. And I, before I put that up on the screen, I asked, how many of you in here know a foreign language and are using that foreign language as a platform to pursue your business interests somewhere? And most of them raised their hands and said, absolutely. Okay, well, how many of you feel comfortable that you can conduct business in this second language? And of course, all the hands went right back up again. And so I threw these terms up on on the uh, projector screen and asked, okay, how many of these do you know? And you, you just saw faces go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, customs duties, tariffs, withholding tax, and you, you go down the list. And, uh, well, I don't know. Well, if you can pr present to an employer, you know, I don't just know missionary language. I don't just know this particular vocabulary, but I've taken business language courses, and I can tell you that I can intelligently conduct conversations about business. Well, you've already differentiated yourself. That was a paid announcement for the global management business yeah. language <laughs> classes. Thank you, Jason. You know, that brings up another question because a lot of students feel like, okay, I speak Spanish, I can do international business. Is language enough or do you need a core competency in addition to the language? And if you do, and tell me what you think, if you do, what would that core competency be? Would it be an accounting degree, or would it be a softer skill like I'm very good with people? And not uh, if all three of you could address that, that would be great. Well, I'm oh, sorry, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I, my two cents worth is just that my husband gets a lot of calls um, from people because they're interested in going to China. Sometimes they don't speak the language, and when they don't, my husband usually just says, "You know what?" It's going to be really tough. I think he feels, at least in the case of China, that language is mandatory. And so it really is important to have language. Other than that, um, I've heard him say that finance, you know, if you've got a background in finance, because that just affects all areas of business, that that's really important. I don't know what you guys would think about that. 
first. I think um, you know the, the short, simple answer is no. Language is not enough. Um, you've got to have something to apply it to. I um, mean, you know, anyone can speak to anybody, but you've got to have some value to add. Um, so yeah, so I think you know that's why there's graduate programs. There's ways to specialize and you know really find your passion and go after that. And the language is just the icing on the cake. The paradox of, of this question is you have to have experience. If you want a good job internationally, you've got to have experience. Well, how do I get experience if I'm out of school? I'm clearly, I, don't have, I haven't lived long enough to get experience, but you want experience to hire me. Well, experience doesn't just mean sitting behind a desk being a manager. Experience means a, a number of things. And experience in an employer's mind is going to really mean if you've got experience working with this market that means you probably know people there you've got contacts and that's a huge one if you've got contacts on the ground you're already more valuable than the next guy that means you can probably navigate the market and take care of yourself we're not going to have to babysit you we're not going to have to handhold you no employer wants to hire somebody and then train them and hold their hand and carry them through until they finally figure it out an employer wants to dump the money into you and make you go. Just go make me money in, in the ideal world. And to the extent that you can be part of the latter group of, hey, I don't need help. I've been there. I've figured it out. I, maybe I've not done business in your definition, but I've, I've done this internship. I know the language. I've gone out of my way to understand business, language there. I, I know people on the ground. And, and you show a passion for, for this particular area. Once again, you're already differentiated. The language isn't enough, is it? Nope. Yes, sir. Um, you guys already addressed this. I came in a little bit late, so if you didn't, I'm sorry. But um, for those of you who lived over and have family overseas that are, the kids are old enough to come have, and if they wanted to come back to the U.S. to go to school here, college, how much of an advantage were they to, or having gone to an international school did they have? And then also, what was it like for them to go to an international school? as far as language goes. I don't know if they're in English or what language they'd be in. And just basically having friends, social life, as far as your kids go. Probably both of us can address, because Marcy was an expat child, so she can address this too. But can, you, can you repeat the question? Oh, Sorry. The question was, what is the impact of um, expatri expatriate children living overseas and then coming back to the U.S., and how does it affect their, their um, further schooling? Um, for my kids, we came back around the time that my children um, and they had never really lived in the states so for the first time they came back when they were in high school and a little bit younger it was a huge adjustment for them and I will say that um, several of my kids it took them two and a half years we've lived here three years now two and a half years of that was just a huge adjustment they feel different than other people I feel different I mean it's difficult for me um, it's hard to say why I've not been able to really pinpoint what the why we feel that way but we just feel a little different we look at the world differently we're just it's it's very strange and we're very aware that we are the different ones you know um, my children had a had a tough time people reached out to them but they found it difficult to really embrace being from Utah in in um, they would have probably had a tough time maybe anywhere but it was really tough for them um, I think that once we told them I think that they kept thinking they were gonna go back home that their home really is in Hong Kong I think they they felt that they were gonna go back and I think that's what made it difficult for them to transition as far as their schooling goes I they they were very much ahead of the game when they came here. You know, schooling was very easy for them. They're all straight A students here. They were not in Hong Kong um, because it's just tougher. At least that was our situation in our school. Um, so it was an advantage. In fact, my son came here and then was, um, he got a scholarship to his university and um, is a straight A student there. And so he just found it very easy, a lot easier. But as far as fitting in and making friends and making that adjustment, we all found that very tough to do. And I know I'm going back overseas, so I find that I kind of hold back and don't really get into everything that I really should as far as forming new friendships and everything here because I know I'm going back at some point. I just assume that I will. And so 
that's just been my experience. I don't know what yours is. Yeah, I think really similar. Um, the, the two things that come to mind are that helped me most, because I um, was overseas from like eight years old until um, my freshman year of high school, came back to the U.S., then went back for th th three years of high school and then came back to go to BYU, then went back for other projects, back and forth and back and forth. And I think what's helped me to embrace kind of this multiculturalism that I've developed is staying connected, finding friends that have those similar mind view or, or world view, and then um, talking about it. So I think communication is really key. I think if you don't kind of talk about the things that you've learned in your experiences as an expatriate um, kid with your friends, I mean, you are an incredible resource for the people around you if you've had those kind of experiences. And to hold that in and think you're weird and not want to share it with people, it's just, it's a crime, I think. I think you really need to just talk about it, not to the point where you annoy people, but which I might have done a little bit. <laughs> but I think, you know, just giving, giving people around you the opportunity to, to learn from your experiences and sharing it. I think the BYU's um, outreach program here, where they go into the schools and you, you teach kids about your experiences overseas is awesome. <coughs> in my view, your two experiences are rather rare in the sense that statistically the vast majority of expat assignments are two to five years. No, that's true. That's true. And two that's to true. five years generally isn't long enough to create some of the difficulties you faced of, of repatriation, which is a whole other Right. probably, in, in, well, in most cases, a more challenging discussion even than expatriation for some of the reasons you mentioned and others. So the assimilation of children back into the culture usually isn't much of a big deal if it's a two to five year assignment, and most employers don't want to keep you there longer than that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and in our situation, in Marcy and in mine, we actually were there long enough that our kids became what they call third culture kids. It's a, it's a totally different thing, and I agree with that. Um, and typically, kids like my children and, and Marcy, they um, tend to feel more comfortable around also other third culture kids because um, it's had such a profound impact on their life. Whereas if you've just been overseas for a couple of years, it was sort of like you took time out of your real life, you know, and did that, whereas this is our real life. So it's a different thing. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, I'm going to ask it. Since 9-11, um, I know when I've traveled overseas, I don't feel the same as I did pre-9-11. Um, either traveling or working overseas, is that a serious issue or a detrimental issue uh, for you as, as, a, as a father or a mother? Or um, is it an issue that's, that's kind of fading, your security living overseas? wherever it might be. You know, interesting, we, we had this very discussion yesterday in the office, and most of us remember the days when an American passport made your life a lot easier. <laughs> all you had to do was wave that little blue baby, and it opened all kinds of doors, and you were treated differently in the global community. Those days are long gone, and, and traveling with an American passport is not the experience it used to be. Uh, in fact, in many cases, it's the opposite. And, and if being conspicuously American before helped you achieve things, the opposite now, I believe, is true. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, it's funny because I've always had this sense, you know, my husband is traveling in China. He could, you know, something could happen to him, and then I wouldn't know where he is because he could just disappear because he's kind of a risk taker. He's not a careful person, and he doesn't carry ID on him. But, um, but I have found since 9-11, I do think about it more. It doesn't change our lifestyle at all because um, we just move past it. But I do find, this is silly, but I keep every phone message he leaves on my phone, I save it on the tape in case something happens. I keep thinking, I've got this tape of all these oh. messages. So it must really play a part in my mind, um, and, and it does make me think. But, you know, he was just in Dubai last week, and, and he, you know, Mike... It depends on the person. He's just always thinking that he's safer traveling around overseas than he is driving a car on I-15. So statistically, he's right. So I don't know. Yeah, just 
my two cents on that is that I, I see that as both a challenge and an opportunity. I think the challenge is, well, we're being watched now more than ever. So that's great in a lot of ways, but it's also, yeah, gotta watch your back. <laughs> okay, I wanna thank uh, Jason, Marcy, and Larry for their time today. And I think what they've given us is, is invaluable. As someone who's lived overseas as well and kind of being a dumb husband sometimes, I think what they say is, is very practical for anyone who would consider doing something internationally. So thank you very much.